I wanted to talk a little bit about the gap between science and politics, and I got so curious, Christian. I mean, what is really the biggest difference between being a policymaker and a scientist or a researcher when it comes to what you want to do practically? I think the fascinating thing is exactly turning knowledge and research uh, into policy. That's absolutely uh, fascinating. And my example of the World Bank social safety nets and return of s fossil fuel subsidies I really, that, that work gets a boost out of good research. If, when you can prove that you, for instance, can get the same poverty impact for a quarter of the price with a social safety net than you can with a fossil fuel subsidy, that's good evidence. That can really, that, that speaks to politicians. You know. you know, in Egypt they say, oh, we can get the same poverty impact for a quarter of the price or fifth of the price. You know. And then we can do good climate policy at the same time. That's a good deal for us, you know. So turning more science, more numbers, more uh, quantitative stuff. And I, my, my ministry here will know that uh, I'm pushing constantly for research, evidence, numbers, 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 uh, in, 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 in to inform my policy. Uh, but still, there's still a consideration between the voters and showing them, you know, these are our results, and if possible, faster results while mm -hmm. you're still in the government. And this is what science says that can be much slower or could be something that you need to give money to this instead of creating jobs or you need to create jobs meanwhile you're uh, doing uh, international aid. Is there not a challenge in between, a tension in between these sometimes? Oh yeah, at home and abroad, that, that agenda is there for sure. Uh, yeah. And right now, of course, all countries in Europe are pressured on their uh, their Financial. economic challenge, uh, unemployment, youth unemployment, uh, Sweden, uh, Denmark, uh, Spain, uh, much worse even. But therefore we need to be able to tell a convincing story also, and I think more research should be done on that, on how this is an investment, how our international engagement is a really good investment in reducing poverty, promoting human rights, s peace and security, but how this investment is a really good deal for Europe as well. Uh, and how it comes back multifold in peace and in security, in less pirates and terrorism, in less um, instability and conflict, in, in fewer refugees and in more jobs and growth in Europe. We have just done a new report that hasn't been published yet, we are still working on it, that tries to make that point. How this is an investment in Europe. And I believe sincerely that only with a stronger international engagement right now can we pull Europe out of the crisis in the long run. Because we are missing big opportunities out there. Africa, fastest growing economy, half of the 20 fastest growing uh, countries in the world are in Africa. You know, there's th that's where we have opportunities, new possibilities for Europe. And if we're not internationally engaged right now, we're gonna miss out big time in the long run. But you, more researchers should come in, show us, prove, discuss, perhaps, you know, uh, it's not a positive story, but then we need to turn it into one, at least. We have to tell the story, to find the story. Gunilla, uh, today we have said that uh, 20 years ago, 90% of the poor lived in poor countries. Today, most of them live in middle, so-called middle-income countries. How do you um, comment? On, should we consider fo focusing on poor people rather than poor countries, or how do you see it? W well, I think we can do both, but it's also to see that we have a division of labor. I, I think what I've said for the Swedish development assistance is that we should address people living, uh, poor people and oppressed people living in low-income countries. But of course, most of our investments goes to poor people in middle-income countries, hopefully to people in the middle-income countries, but we also still in our area lack some good evaluation, some good results. We don't have enough data. Uh, we have to be much better in collecting data and prove the evidence back home to our voters because we still have, and I would like to touch a little bit upon this with research, because sometimes I'm who are coming from a farmer's family and didn't do any research in my young years, I really looked into reality. But the problem when doing development assistance is that you're doing it from your own prejudice back home. And your voters mm, are also. from here, and they are feeded by uh, Swedish news and media, 
so it's, it's not always that the science and the evidence are trickling down. And sometimes the science, as I see it, is not really designed for politics. Even though we are coming from the Nordic countries where we do believe in science, that has made a, f made a fundamental basis for our welfare state. What, what that do we you believe mean that in, we are realistic. What do you mean that science is not made for politics? No, but How do you uh, mean? sometimes when you have a good report, you have really to translate it four times in order to make it... A for, for, for those people that are working with development assistance or to my friends in the Swedish parliament, it's really, you know, because sometimes there is an academic discussion going on that is not for people that are making the decisions. And here we have to have Swedish parliament with us. We have to have... And, and sometimes I feel that there is a huge gap. And sometimes that that gap is too alarming because we have, doing development assistance, to, in many aspects interpret this not only for a Swedish audience but also to make it in conformity to the poor people because they are my other servants. Y y what you I have to serve. I serve the Swedish taxpayers and I serve the poor people in the world. Yeah. But also to see that these agendas are converging. And it's really that we have to really see that we work with the people based upon science and evidence. And here is still a linkage to be made. So how would you like it to be? I'd like it to be more much more practical. And I like us who are doing development assistance to really prove the evidence and the results and to show that this is a good krona invested for our common future because that also speaks to all our politicians because we are happy to have quite a generous aid budget. But I mean, it can't be taken for granted. We have to win that every, every year. No, not in Sweden. We have it every four years. Yeah. Every four years. Yes, exactly. <laughs> because now we have a parliament that really believes in it. Yeah. But it's not taking for granted. No. So I think if we can't root this in a legitimacy for development assistance and also to show the proof. And that's why we have to work a little bit more on this with science when we are deciding upon our policies. But again, I think we really have to address the knowledge and the awareness about people living in low- and middle-income countries. And thereby, I'm really impressed by our own history in doing research with our development assistance. And not only have the research from Europe on this, but also to have the local capacity in many developing countries that has benefited from our development assistance to build their own capacity, to do their own interpretation, and to show that this is actually valuable knowledge. That's interesting because the researchers or the scientists often say, oh, we want the politicians to listen to us. We want them to take our research in consideration because we have a lot of things to tell you. And you say, we would like to, but we need to understand it better and make it realistic for us. So there is a possibility. Here. Yeah, but it takes two to tango. I think we should be you better want as tango? politicians. Oh. <laughs> but I think also that researchers have to realize in what conditions politicians political decisions are made these days. Okay. Before I let the audience in, I'm very proud to welcome Mr. Steven Anna Atu Arter. He's a member of parliament in Ghana and uh, a former uh, minister, a local minister and mayor, and he is here with us today. Uh, applaud. <laughs> One of the things we had talked about today is also improving effective and good governance in the developing countries and well you have listened uh, both to the ministers today yeah, yeah. and you've listened all day yes yeah. so are we on the right track on the right in the right direction do you think yes uh, thank you very much but before i get there let me uh, say a big thank you to you and you wider for the invitation extended to me to be here today and to you, my honorable ministers, it's an honor for me to share the same stage with you. Um, I must say that climate change is a reality. Earlier on, it was just a conjecture. Everybody thought that, oh, um, this is something very far away from us. But if, since this morning, and what is happening in Africa, particularly Ghana, uh, it is a reality. If um, Rainfall is becoming erratic. If temperatures are rising, on the average 1.72 uh, degrees Celsius, uh, nobody will tell you that it is a reality. But is it that the local people out there really appreciate that there is climate change? That is a big question. If I tell you, you go to so many places in Ghana, and being so religious, they tell you that the erratic rainfall is the will of God the end is near. 
it, it, it tells you that it's been attributed to something else. You know, um, the end is near. <laughs> Which end is near, I don't know, but that is, that is something um, which, which is out there. It also tells you that uh, most of the um, response from our areas, to me, is becoming more of responding to international aid architecture uh, reporting uh, sort of mechanism. If the look, including parliament, including parliament, how many times do we go out there and talk on platforms, podcast platforms, about climate change? It also tells you that we, myself, in parliament, institutions and others, need to build their capacity to even, to even be able to talk about climate-sensitive budgets in our parliament. If in parliament people do not really appreciate it, and then you go to uh, decentralized department, the councils, uh, how would they be able to actually develop uh, medium-term plans that respond to climate change? But again, the debate which has also come up, I listened to it here when the Honorable Minister uh, from Denmark spoke on um, tariffs, for instance, removing tariffs. Um, about 15 years ago in Ghana, we saw this threat of climate change. And for that matter, we subsidized LPG, uh, um, liquefied uh, petroleum gas so that a lot of people will not be continuing felling trees for fuel wood, but then they will be using gas. The development partners, the Bretton Woods institutions are telling Ghana that, look, if you don't remove the subsidies, uh, <laughs> this and that, you're not going to get them any longer. For that matter, this year, uh, we removed subsidies from liquefied petroleum gas. You go to rural areas, people have gone back to cutting down trees for fuel wood. So that debate about um, you know, subsidies do not get to the poor is something that perhaps will be with us for, for some time. It is true this morning I heard from uh, Cesar that aid flows have been continuing to Africa and she made mention of uh, Ghana. It is true. But the bad news is this. From 2012 to 2022, the 10 year period, Development partners have signed a compact with Ghana saying that uh, Ghana has suddenly become a lower middle income country. There is oil find in Ghana, and for that matter, by 2022, aid will cease. From 2012 to 2020, uh, 2022, it will be waning until it ceases by that time. How then would we be able to mitigate some of these challenges that climate change will definitely uh, bring to us? That is a big question. What would, you like, what, what would you like to see now from the aid donors? I mean, you have. I think more. that the dialogue that Honorable Ministers made mention of is very, very, very important. It has come to be like it is. Uh, country owned, but is it really <laughs> Ghana owned or responding to what the need that was see that what USAID and others really want Ghana to do? So that aspect of country owned, I don't really think we own it. We're responding to what the development partners want us to do to a large extent. Yeah. But a dialogue that uh, has come up here, I think is very important. If both of us sit down, we agree that, look, this is the way the people of Sweden, the people of um, Denmark want it to be done. This is the way Ghana wants it, want to see it. We meet at that level. I think it will solve the problem than, um, you know, responding to perhaps, you know, call it the powers that be. Uh, we also talk about multilateral uh, versus bilateral um, most people saying that multilateral would be more effective, but you are talking about sitting down with Sweden and Denmark. What, no, bilaterals uh, in Ghana are doing very well. They mm -hmm. are actually contributing to budgetary support uh, in Ghana, and it's going to about between 8 and 10 percent annually, which to me is quite huge, between 400 and 500 million uh, dollars yearly, which is quite huge. Uh, so, yes, so, so, so you think that's g working well? To me, it is working. The area that we need to uh, engage each other the more, that's the area that I'm talking about, it's working. 
Okay, comments on that? I think what, what Christian also said earlier, and where we also have to sit down together a little bit better, is also where we see the aspiration now in Africa about uh, the capacity and the thinking about how to have much more sustainability where Europe might lose out. Because we are so full of ourselves, yeah. so we don't see the developments on the continent with a lot of aspiring also high-tech, a lot of knowledgeable people thinking about how to solve a practical problem. And they might be very local, but then can be scaled up. And also making these leapfrogging in technologies. So I think that's why we not only have to leverage on aid, <laughs> we also have to see how our private sector uh, mm. can also have a, a platforms for further discussions, some other capital flows, but also innovation, technology and research that should be much more extended and, and, and uh, changed, uh, exchanged. Uh, because here I, I sense that we, we have, specifically with Africa, solve our problems together. And we are not really organizing for that. And perhaps development assistance can be a better stepping stone mm. for it. But, but what do you the two of you say? Um, bilateral, multilateral, what would be the balance? <coughs> well, we are increasing our multilateral share of aid. But I don't think that's the most important question, no. perhaps. I think the most important question is how do we form a relationship between mm. Ghana and Denmark? And, and I must say, um, I think we've had very good results together, and also by means of budget support. And I'm a huge fan of uh, budget support. Sorry, <laughs> uh, Gunilla. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, because it, it's it, it's it's a starting point for a contractual relationship between us. First of and 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 that's how we have to go forward. And I think that what we wrote in the paper that Channing and I wrote is, uh, which was a little bit provocative, is that the global blame game has to be over, right? Uh, you know, we the global blame game. Blame uh, in, in game. When, it, when we talk about climate change, you know, the global blame game has to be over. We cannot any longer have f negotiations internationally. We, we say it was your fault, so you have mm. to uh, solve it before we can sue anything. And if you don't solve it first, then we won't do anything. You know, that is not taking us anywhere. And what we wrote in the paper, and Channing wrote it, so I can quote it, uh, uh <laughs> is uh, the world comes as a package, right? It comes as a package, and. And and there, okay, uh, we are responsible for climate change, but we also invested in windmills. It's true uh, that 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 we did not behave well in colonial times, but we have uh, developed a few vaccines. Uh, on the other hand, and the mobile phone, so the world comes as a package, uh, <laughs> and you get it all. And and that's why we need to get rid of that kind of uh, your fault, my fault, uh, uh, and let's work together. But let's do it in a contractual relationship. And I think budget support is brilliant to do that where we can say to Ghana, we will add our bit, we will come and, help and assist you because we believe that everybody has core human rights and we should get them in place in Ghana as well. We also believe that Ghana uh, have a huge opportunities in terms of uh, renewable energy, mm -hmm. uh, in terms uh, of uh, preserving the forest for all its values. And so let's do kind of a contractual relationship and, and say we'll add our part, you'll add yours. Uh, and that's results-based approaches to development. And they can come multilaterally, Global Partnership for Education, the Global Fund for HIV AIDS, but it's kind of a relationship like that, and it can come bilaterally. But how do you create uh, governments that urge uh, adaptation and mitigation to climate change? Because that is, has really been a big topic here today, that good governance is the key mm. for promoting this. But that's why I want us to move out of this kind of aid dependency. And that's also what we hear from Africa now. We gain independence, but we are still dependent on aid. And we have to have a true relation that is based upon equal understanding and equal responsibility. And that's why I think the governance issue is key. But if we only think it can be promoted from donors doing development assistance and capacity building, I think we are doing a mistake. We have to really see and to hold Africans themselves accountable for doing the job, like Ghana has done and Botswana. Sweden are not any bilateral donor to Ghana. We are even more than Denmark in situations of fragility and going into to, to very weak situations, so we are hardly in no middle-income countries any longer. Uh, and that means that we have another view of looking of this, and I think when it comes to multilateral aid or bilateral, it doesn't matter, it's the result that counts. And where I see in the future, we see that could be the trading house for figuring out where to spend the money, because they already today do a lot of multilateral. But the debate about how we govern the world has to be based on equal understanding, and not because I'm a donor, you're a recipient. 
And that's why we have to start to talk about global governance and look to ourselves and look to Europe if we are trustworthy, because sometimes we also have double standards. Right. And that's why I think it really has to be rooted from local also these things with understanding the need for good governance. And thereby you can manage new scientific research, you have to make better budgets in the parliament, you can mobilize your own resources and to be held accountable yourself. But while that is taking place, of course uh, we should support good governance and, and, and assist in capacity building on that, right. but that is not the only key.